Hello. Good morning. My name is Michal Wisniewski. I represent the International Cultural Center. And uh, I will have this privilege to moderate uh, today's session dedicated to, uh, dedicated to uh, resilience. Uh, we started yesterday with three really inspiring uh, presentations. Today we will have seven presentations. Uh, right now we're going to have four of them. Then we'll have a break and at uh, 4.30 uh, the second uh, panel of today dedicated to resilience uh, is going to uh, happen. Uh, so, uh, welcome, uh, welcome all of you who decided to uh, join us, who decided to uh, discuss the topic of resilience, resilience, adaptiveness, change. As we heard yesterday during one of the presentation, uh, at present we should not discuss how to conserve heritage, uh, but we should discuss the question how we can and how we should change uh, the cultural heritage, how to adapt, how to collaborate with the uh, objects coming from the past and playing very important role in our contemporary. So, uh, I would like to welcome the four speaker of the first part of today's resilience session. Uh, at first, I would like to welcome Solveiga Krumina Konkova from Latvia. I would like to welcome as well Edita Gavron, uh, this time from Krakow, Poland. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Wenceslav Mir from Romania and uh, last but not least, I would like to welcome Tobias Strachl from uh, Germany. Uh, at first, uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to <coughs> uh, Professor uh, Solveiga Kromina Konkova. Uh, she's a leading researcher at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology of the University of Latvia, and she's also a corresponding member of the Latvian Academy of uh, Sciences. Her academic interests cover the history of religious philosophical ideas and cultural studies. She's an author of several monographs and more than 150 scholarly articles published in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Russia, USA, among the others. Uh, in recent years, she has also studied the dark heritage in Latvia in a project founded by the Latvian Council of Science. Uh, its name is Difficult Heritage Between the Memorization and Contemporary Tourism Production and Consumption, the case of Holocaust sites in Latvia. Uh, Professor uh, Kromina Konkova is going to present us a topic entitled Heritage of Atrocity in Latvia, the Symbolic Language of Holocaust, Memorials and its Interpretation in Changing Political and Cultural Context. Professor uh, Krumina Konkova, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Hello. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for the possibility to take part in this very interesting forum and uh, introduce you with the project on the difficult heritage in Latvia. Uh, my research is a small part uh, of uh, this project. There is a heritage that delights us, and there is a heritage that orders us, but which we have no right to forget. Holocaust memorials are such a legacy. There are a total of 265 Holocaust sites all around Latvia. Only some of them are marked by memorials. Most of Holocaust memorials in Latvia are designed according to a particular gender of Holocaust memorial art, with a specific repertoire of symbols. Uh, so, uh, nevertheless, there are essential differences in the comprehension of memorial's message. If you visited various Holocaust-related memorials, you would notice that they address you differently leaving a deep impression or not evoking any emotions. Regarding some, you probably would not understand what this place is all about. If they belong to the same gender and follow specific requirements of symbols, materials and forms, 
What is the reason for these variations in impressions? One possible explanation could be found using uh, the concept Lieu de Memoir elaborated by French historian Pierre Nora. According to Nora, Lieu de Memoir places of memory are the places where memory is crystallized, in which it finds refuge. Nora emphasized that in these places a residual sense of continuity remains. For further explanation, Nora also highlights the essential differences and even rapture between history and memory. Lieu de Memoir have a growing importance in the relationships between memory and history because they lie between them. They do not allow an event to become only a thing of the past. The task of these places is to return the event, revive it into individual memory and memory of society as well. From such point of view, memorials also should be lieu de memoir because they are the betweeners, that is, they are between memory and history. At least we can evaluate memorials according to whether they are only topographical marks of historical places or are such places of memory. However, a memorial is not only a place of memory. It is a more complicated case with material, symbolic and functional significance. It can be said that memorial should be both a place of memory and a historical text that is also forward-looking. Historical text can be attributed to inscriptions on and near the memorials and symbols used, their location and even a road to them. Both sides of memorial have a complex dialectic of interrelationships. They can complement each other, work together and work against, and even destroy. The following examples of Holocaust memorials uh, in the Vidzeme in north central Latvia will be analyzed referring to this dialectic and showing the possibility of a significantly different interpretation of memorial symbolic language and different public attitudes towards Latvia's atrocity heritage. The largest and therefore also the most famous Holocaust memorials are in and near Riga. The memorial in the Bitterneki forest is where about 35,000 people were killed during the Nazi occupation. 20,000 of them were Jews. About 12,000 of these 20,000 were Jews from other European countries. About 15,000 were Soviet prisoners of war. A memorial to the victims of Nazism of all nationalities was unveiled in 2001. About 25,000 prisoners of the Riga ghetto, almost 100 foreign Jews brought from Berlin and Soviet prisoners of war were killed in the Rumbula forest. In 1964, a monument to the victims of fascism was erected there, but in 2002, a memorial was unveiled. However, along with these monuments visited by tourists, there are monuments forgotten by all. The silence of the Holocaust imposed by the Soviet regime a currently indefinite attitude to the commemoration of Soviet activists killed in the beginning of the Second World War II have led to the fact that many sites of mass murder today can be indicated only by coordinates recorded in some archival documents or books. Still, the sites themselves are no longer found and even those living near uh, these sites do not know terrible events related to them. It can be said that these places have ceased to be memory places. Referring to Nora, without commemorative vigilance, history has soon swept them away. In some cases, the first memorials erected immediately after World War II have survived. There are designed as tombstones, thus symbolizing the sorrow for the dead. However, the epitaphs of several monuments do not contain more detailed information about those for whom we mourn. Created accordingly to the Soviet guideline of anonymous Soviet citizens victims of the Nazi regime, the epitaphs 
render this morning meaningless and turn the memory into its absence. One such example is the Smilton Forest Cemetery Memorial, where in, in 1947 a part of the remains of the 200 Jews killed near Smilton was reburied. The inscription of this mem memorial states, Eternal remembrance to those fallen we built. In joint work for the future, we find strength in remembrance of heroes. The inscription does not indicate anything about Holocaust victims. The victims to whom this monument was dedicated are anonymous. Understandably, many of the victims were unknown. Currently, their names are found out, but the anonymity continues, and this memorial seems does not longer evoke memories. In 1948, a monument was unveiled on the site of the mass murder in Chelderle near Valmira. It was dedicated to all victims killed on this site, approximately 3,000 residents of Valmir. The monument has the inscription to victims of fascism of 1941, with a poem like that one in Smilton. This monument has not undergone any significant changes since Soviet times, but its impression is entirely different compared to the Smilton monument. Regarding Chelderleia, we can talk about the complementary relations between this place of memory and the historical text. In this case, the historical text is not the epitaph or information about the massacres in Chelderleia, but firstly, the location of the site itself in a forested ravine. For those who know what happened in Chelderleia, the road to the monument built by Nazis in 1941 is also a historical text. It inadvertently allows us to imagine the people driving to Chelderleia many decades ago and their feelings. Thus the path tells us what we could see next. And not even what we will see, but rather feel a depressing morning silence. The mood of this place of memory dominates over the anonymizing inscription of the monument, essentially abolishing it. Of course, it should be noted here that this memory place is focused on individual psychology, but not on the collective commemoration of the massacre. One more example is the monument in the Smetsre Pine Forest near Madonna, created by Guido Booth in 1993. About 700, 700 residents of Madonna and its vicinity were killed around the monument's locus in one day on August 8, 1941. Among the victims, 250 were Jews. Vido Booth successfully forms an imposing experiential space. Its shape closely links to the terrible events with which this place is associated with the local people's memories. From the older generation's stories, some of the shot people were buried still alive. However, this monument was initially erected without any inscriptions on or next to it. Only in 2006, a small stone was placed with the inscription the memorial place of the residents of Madonna and its vicinity killed after the invasion of Nazi German army. However, this inscription practically does not change the site's impact on the visitors, even if they know nothing about what happened there. The monument created by Booth as a symbol of death's presence in all its inevitability only acquires an additional connection to a concrete event. If we return to relations between the place of memory and the historical text in the message carried by a particular memorial, then in the cases of the Smets Repine Forest Memorial and the Childerlay Memorial, the place of memory is undoubtedly dominant. Moreover, it has become a convincing historical testimony of the past massacre, making you feel the events horrors emotionally. Nevertheless, what to do with memorials when they no longer work as lieu de memoir and have turned into merely historic sites, for which part of the public has no interest? 
Perhaps at first they have to be transformed as historical texts, so it would be possible to return them also as places of memory. Paradoxically, but it could succeed. During the Soviet era, the symbol of uh, social resistance was used in the memorial of the Nazi victims in Volka. Despite the documentary information of what happened at the place where the monument was erected, it had no inscriptions. Thus, it, had, it can be said that the figure of a man depicted in the monument carried a misleading message about this place of death. The man with a flag symbolizes respect for the comrades killed in this place in 1941. However, most of the victims were Jewish women and children. Moreover, in Soviet times such monuments were used to be seen in many parks, where this monument would probably have fit more than in this place of Nazi crime. The monument seems broken the trace between the past event and the place where it was erected, so this place has ceased to be a place of memory. The significance of a historical text with which the memorial Valk addresses the visitors and creates a definite emotional experience becomes apparent only after the memorial's restoration. In 2008, the Council of Jewish Communities of Latvia erected a memorial stone not far from the Soviet monuments stone with the concrete names of murdered people. Visitors can now read the names of whole families killed at this, site, at this site, and this opportunity perhaps changes their attitude towards the past event, and for them it is no more just a forgotten fact of history. Uh, the history of Holocaust memorials in Latvia is like the history of these memorials I think elsewhere in Europe. It reflects changes in post-war political culture and how similar and different is the reception of the events of the Holocaust by one or another of post-war generations. Although Soviet authorities erected memorials in the Nazi atrocities places, the victims of the murders were anonymized. Moreover, as in the example of Valka, the monument's symbolic language is used for a deliberately misleading message. In several cases, the memorials do not fully function as Lude Memoir and have turned into merely historic sites for which part of the public, I, I, I can say, uh, the most part of the public has no interest. In the early 1990s, as the political and social context changed, so did the messages of the memorials in Latvia. With them, the memories of Holocaust and its victims returned. Currently, Holocaust memorials are opened in Latvia every year, and new symbols, both religious and universal, are being introduced into their iconography. Furthermore, these memorials are no longer just a message about the past, but also warning sites for the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so very much. Um, I would like to express my gratitude for this presentation. Uh, you got uh, the very important and actually universal problem of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, at least in Poland. Uh, it is visible actually almost everywhere. Uh, the fact that we lost something very important uh, about our history and about our memory, that uh, for a long period of time this uh, history was manipulated and uh, during the last uh, 30 years we are trying to regain this past and um, also in uh, our country but i think uh, it is the problem of the entire region uh, the establishment of the new uh, places of memory the memoirs uh, is something very important and uh, and crucial uh, i should say also that uh, uh, Please, uh, uh, right now I would like to say a few words to all of the participants of this panel. Uh, please use chat. Uh, the chat will help us to communicate and using the chat uh, you will be able to uh, you will be able to uh, 
send questions, notes, uh, and and uh, we'll be able to uh, discuss uh, later on after the uh, all uh, four presentations. We'll have the time for the questions and answers session. Uh, well, uh, once again, I would like to express my thanks to Professor Solvega Krumina Konkova. And right now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Edyta Gavron, this time from Krakow, from Poland. Uh, Professor Gavron, uh, Dr. Gavron uh, is an assistant professor at the Institute of the Jewish Studies at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Uh, she's the former director of the Center of the uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Gavron, uh, she's the former director at the Center of the Study of the History and Culture of Krakow Jews. Uh, she's an author of several publications on the Holocaust and post-Holocaust history uh, of Jews in Poland, in particular in Krakow. Uh, she's a specialist in the 20th century history of the Polish Jews and Holocaust studies. She has cooperated with various academic institutions and museums in Poland and abroad, serves as the president of the management board of Galicia Jewish Heritage Institute Foundation and the chairperson of the scientific advisory board of European Holocaust Research Infrastructure Project and has been on the team that designed the historical museum in Oskar Schindler's factory in Krakow. Uh, Professor Gavron uh, will uh, discuss uh, the issue of the heritage of the Ashkenazi Jews in the changing urban landscape of Krakow. Can we start? I don't know if I'm uh, heard properly. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, you uh, can hear me well, and I know you can see the presentation. Uh, the aim of my paper is to point the main elements of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage in Krakow and to examine uh, to what extent they have been preserved and promoted during the I have started I hope you can hear me yes we can It looks that we had some technical problem uh, and uh, we will try to connect with Dr. Gavron again. Uh, okay, I'm, uh -oh. I'm back and I hope you can hear me. I'm sorry for the uh, some problems with the connection. I would like to uh, have the confirmation that you can hear me and see me. Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, let me start because uh, I, I have already some delay and uh, um, apologies for the, um, uh, uh, the 
the late start and uh, this uh, technical problems. Uh, the aim of my paper is to point the main elements of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage in Krakow and to examine to what extent they have been preserved and promoted uh, during the recent changes within the city. And if they were not, uh, why uh, they were forgotten, abandoned or destroyed. Uh, before I start, organizers uh, of the conference uh, as well as the support team uh, for the excellent preparation of the forum. I would like to ex uh, express my uh, special gratitude to the International Cultural Center in Krakow, uh, not just for the, their continued effort to organize uh, this Heritage Forum, uh, but also for their 30 years of teaching and inspiring, offering the platform for the discussion on Central European heritage and identity. In particular, uh, I would like to uh, thank for one event organized uh, by, the, uh, by the center in 2007, in November of 2007, uh, the meeting, the discussion that accompanied the exhibition, A World Before a Catastrophe, Krakow's Jews Between the Wars. Uh, the event was titled uh, to restore or to reclaim the memory, uh, the future of Jewish heritage in Krakow. Uh, and uh, this uh, discussion was led by Professor Jacek Purchla uh, and it involved uh, two people, uh, Henrik Halkowski uh, being one of them. Henrik Halkowski was an architect and philosopher by profession, historian, thinker, and writer by passion. Uh, and uh, in his multiple texts, uh, but also during this event, uh, particularly during this event, uh, he uh, explicitly uh, uh, made an attempt to draw our attention uh, to uh, the heritage of Krakow's Jews and uh, their impact on Ashkenazi identity in the world. He looked at the history of Krakow's Jews, not only through the lens of uh, the Holocaust and loss, uh, but also uh, through the history before it. And he demanded that we should embrace the heritage of uh, Krakow's Jews and appreciate their role in shaping contemporary Ashkenazi world. As the active participant of this discussion, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and uh, in the context of uh, the heritage, uh, Henrik Halkowski pointed uh, the issue of identity. Uh, he uh, very often reflected on uh, what uh, shapes our identity. How do we want uh, to shape our identity based on what we are proud of? Uh, and uh, how we can develop uh, this identity as a community, as the society, as the inhabitants of uh, Krakow, as Jews and non-Jews. Uh, what fragment of history and heritage uh, do we uh, want to identify with and should we identify with? And uh, Halkowski um, pointed that uh, um, the history of the 16th and 17th century of uh, Krakow's Jews is one of the elements of the history uh, that uh, we should be proud of because at this point, uh, Jewish community uh, was uh, uh, making uh, the, the city one of the two or three most important Jewish cities in uh, Europe or Jewish communities in Europe, given its uh, spiritual, religious, uh, cultural, economic and social aspects. Uh, so uh, Halkowski also uh, pointed that there is uh, a difference between uh, uh, being proud of something and uh, being responsible to emphasize uh, or focus on something like a uh, Holocaust memory. And uh, we, uh, we uh, should remember Holocaust, we should commemorate the Holocaust, but this is not something that ma makes uh, us proud, that uh, this is not the part of the history that uh, should shape us as uh, the community. Uh, the uh, element that uh, Halkowski um, was really focused on, and I would like to um, uh, 
continue uh, this focus is uh, the Ashkenazi identity. Um, he had the uh, very good understanding of what it means uh, to be Ashkenazi Jew and how Krakowians, uh, uh, Krakow's Jews, uh, uh, fit uh, the model of Ashkenazi community, Ashkenazi uh, uh, Jews, uh, and Ashkenazi uh, culture. And uh, he also, um, even if focusing on the modern times, he also um, uh, drew attention to the fact that uh, there are many um, um, individuals in Krakow, uh, Jews, uh, who um, uh, accomplished a lot uh, and uh, they were outstanding uh, residents of Krakow and uh, they are still not uh, proper, properly acknowledged and we should be um, proud of them, but first we should learn and acknowledge their uh, um, activities. Uh, so. Um, like um, uh, like Halkowski, uh, I am aware that, uh, of course, uh, the city of Krakow has done uh, a lot, at least within the past uh, years, uh, from my perspective. Unfortunately, Henrik Halkowski is not with us any longer. Uh, for the past uh, 15 years, uh, the city of Krakow has uh, done a lot to commemorate uh, uh, the tragedy of the Jews. Uh, um, not only to mention the new installations, the commemoration sites and in Podgorze at the Ghetto Hero Square, but also uh, the current project, the current development in Płaszów, uh, the museum and the memory uh, site uh, at the former Nazi German concentration camp of Płaszów. Uh, but it's also uh, important to mention the memory trail of the Museum of Krakow with its uh, stops in the museum's units in the pharmacy under the Eagle and Schindler's factory. Uh, the Museum of, Krak <clears throat> of Krakow and other institutions, including the ones I represent, uh, the Institute of Jewish Studies at the Egelonian University and Galicia Jewish Museum in Krakow, have done a lot uh, to research and po to popularize uh, the history of, uh, of Krakow's Jews. And I should rather say, for the benefit uh, of my claim, the Jews of Krakow. Uh, with all the extended knowledge, we might rethink and uh, our concept of Krakow's Jews and embrace the fact uh, that the city incorporated many Jews from the West, from the East, from the South as well, uh, but it also, uh, the city itself with its Jewish uh, institution, institutions, it um, shaped uh, many individuals, it educated uh, many people who then um, traveled, emigrated and shaped other Ashkenazi communities uh, in Europe and uh, outside of Europe. So uh, my claim is to to think wider and to think about uh, Krakowian Jews as uh, the group uh, of Ashkenazi Jews and to embrace this Ashkenazi identity also uh, in thinking about the Jewish heritage in Krakow. And uh, like uh, we try to um, think uh, in the European, European uh, um, dimension about our uh, identities of particular countries, I think as uh, uh, Jews, we, th we should think, uh, but also non-Jews, uh, um, about uh, the Jewish heritage in the context of uh, Ashkenazi, uh, Ashkenazi uh, tradition and Ashkenazi culture. And of course, Ashkenazi culture, uh, Ashkenazi tradition is not uh, uh, narrowed to one country, one region, one city. Uh, it's much broader, it was much broader, and it migrated um, from, uh, from the west uh, to the east. Uh, and now uh, Ashkenazi Jews make uh, a significant part of the Jewish uh, population around uh, the world. Uh, so that's why uh, I would like to draw um, your attention following the Halkowski claims to think about um, uh, the heritage of Krakow's Jews in the Ashkenazi uh, uh, um, tradition, in the Ashkenazi uh, framework. Uh, and certainly there are many elements uh, that uh, could be more um, 
uh, visible um, in the city of Krakow uh, in the thinking of uh, the past and present. Uh, one of the um, elements that it's uh, present, but not entirely uh, acknowledged uh, within the city itself, even within the Jewish community, is the impact uh, the Jewish community of Krakow uh, made uh, on Ashkenazi um, world, uh, given uh, the fact that uh, the uh, uh, local rabbi, uh, Moshe Israeles, uh, was uh, one of the codificators of the Jewish law, and he codificated the, uh, or he, he wrote the comments uh, to the codification of the Jew religious law in the Ashkenazi uh, tradition. Uh, this is something that uh, is being used, has been used by the entire uh, Jewish uh, Ashkenazi community all around the world. But it's just the fragment of the intellectual uh, and religious uh, uh, heritage of uh, Krakowian um, Ashkenazi Jews from Krakow. And it's one of the elements that uh, uh, sort of resonated uh, in Europe at the time when uh, Moshe Israeles uh, was active. But of course, uh, um, the traces of this period uh, are uh, much richer. And uh, if we look at the material heritage, we see elements of Ashkenazi heritage as well. Uh, some of them are preserved, some of them are not. Um, and there are still the ongoing attempts uh, to uh, preserve what is left, but these uh, attempts are quite selective. Uh, in uh, the attempts of uh, the research and uh, preservation, of course, some um, uh, digital reconstruction was needed and such was done uh, by the Museum of Krakow. At that time, it was the Historical Museum of the City of Krakow. Uh, and uh, this uh, visual this, uh, the recon uh, reconstructions of uh, the first Jewish settlements in Krakow certainly uh, showed us the richness of Jewish life uh, in uh, the centuries uh, before us. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not much of the material um, traces uh, um, are left, uh, but there are some and uh, we still should focus, focus on uh, preserving them. Of course, um, the reconstruction was uh, pointing the main uh, Jewish settlements in Kazimierz, uh, including Sharoka Street. Um, and uh, based on this reconstruction, we can see what was destroyed, what is preserved. And uh, certainly these uh, reconstructions can uh, guide us uh, to preserve whatever else is left and not properly protected. Uh, and uh, these reconstructions also allow us to see the development of uh, the uh, Jewish settlements in uh, the city then district of Kazimierz. Uh, and uh, it allows us to see um, uh, how uh, wide was the area that Jews used to live uh, and uh, used to enrich uh, within the framework of Krakow. And uh, just uh, focusing on the earlier photo of Krakow, I would like to mention that the a presence, the past presence of um, Jews uh, in Krakow was uh, noted not only in uh, Kazimierz, but also, and it started in the old city of Krakow and uh, simultaneously um, it later on developed in the city then district of uh, Podgorze. Uh, in the late 19th century and 20th century, the Jews lived in almost all other parts of uh, Krakow. Of course, um, I cannot uh, focus on all the uh, elements of Ashkenazi heritage, but uh, let me just mention uh, the uh, when uh, religious uh, heritage is concerned, uh, not only the Orthodox Judaism, but also progressive Judaism, uh, not only religious life, but also secular life. And uh, we associate the material heritage of Jews in Krakow, uh, um, the Ashkenazi Jews in Krakow, with the synagogues mainly. But we should be aware that, we're, that there were many other places, prayer houses, individual uh, buildings that uh, shaped uh, the community, that served the community as well. And they are uh, not um, uh, remembered in any way or not commemorated in, in any way. Uh, while um, the religious sites 
are um, uh, to some extent uh, preserved. Uh, there are many um, private buildings that played key role uh, uh, through the centuries to um, uh, in the life of the Jewish community. And I think uh, the public knowledge and uh, the public awareness of their role uh, is uh, still being limited. Uh, so this is this contradiction between um, uh, the religious uh, heritage and uh, uh, secular heritage that uh, we see in the context of preservation. Uh, one of them, um, you know, just the example, are the uh, places that served uh, on daily uh, for daily life of uh, Krakowian Jews, uh, uh, like uh, on uh, markets, uh, market squares, uh, and uh, uh, market uh, places. Uh, and of course, uh, the debate uh, to what to do with the Jewish heritage uh, has uh, multiple phases. Uh, one of the recent uh, uh, debates was about what to do with uh, Kazimierz. Of course, this is the ongoing debate. Uh, it started over 10 years ago and it continues. Uh, but I think in this uh, debate, we are losing the focus on uh, much deeper and wider Jewish heritage. There is no deep enough discussion on what uh, should be the priorities of uh, preserving uh, Jewish heritage. And certainly there are disproportions between commemorating the uh, Holocaust sites and uh, the Jewish heritage, uh, heritage uh, sites uh, um, as we uh, look at the proportions in the history. And uh, as we look at particular buildings, uh, there are also uh, differences that can be noticed. Uh, um, there are almost no traces of Jewish presence in the old town. Uh, most of the traces of the past are preserved in the district of uh, Kazimierz, and very few uh, beside uh, the Holocaust sites are preserved in uh, Podgorze, which needs to uh, uh, um, needs, needs some attention. Uh, and certainly, uh, I do not want to diminish the efforts to renovate the synagogues and to uh, to preserve what is left. Uh, but let's not forget, uh, while preserving the buildings, about the community. And if you need a picture of the community before the Holocaust, I think the one of the last moving traces of it was filmed in 1939 uh, by Goskind brothers, uh, and it was uh, distributed as Jewish life in Krakow uh, just before the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, my last line, as uh, the time uh, um, has already um, uh, evaporated, uh, uh, I would like to um, just make an appeal that we should uh, should think about Krakowian Jews or Jews in Krakow in this wider context, that we should incorporate the wider narrative uh, to embrace also all the tourists who are coming to Krakow, who do not necessarily identify with the city itself, but they certainly identify with Ashkenazi culture, with uh, the uh, Ashkenazi history in the city of Krakow and let's uh, allow them to, to feel it and uh, to understand it better while they visit the city. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, well, I'm from Krakow, so this uh, topic touches me a lot uh, and maybe I'm not the best person to uh, comment, but um, to a certain extent, uh, this topic is universal for the entire Central Europe. Uh, losing the memory, regaining the memory, interpretation uh, of the Jewish past, uh, difficult discussions about the uh, Holocaust uh, and uh, its um, uh, signs, its memorials and uh, also the question of tourists coming from all over the world uh, only to uh, meet this very tragic uh, past, this very tragic moment in the history of uh, Central uh, and Eastern Europe and uh, of Poland in particular. I have some questions, but I will keep them for the later part of our session. We still have two presentations and uh, uh, I would like to express my gratitude for this uh, presentation. And now I would like to uh, give the floor for the third uh, speaker of this very part of the resilience session, namely uh, Veceslav Mir. Veceslav Mir is 
coming from uh, Romania, representing Babes Bola University. Uh, he is a second year student at the doctoral school in administration and public policy at the Babes Bola University in Romania. Uh, he received a bachelor degree in Russian uh, philology at the Pushkin State Russian Language Institute and in public administration at the Babes Bola uh, University. His master's degree uh, is in cultural heritage and tourism. Uh, his interest uh, is mainly in cultural heritage and city resilience, uh, city soft power and cultural education. So, uh, right now we are going to uh, skip the topic of the uh, problematic past of Central and Eastern Europe and uh, would like to, and we will discuss a little bit different um, issues. The name of the presentation by Vetseslav Mir is Heritage as an Element of Cities, Soft Power in the Context of Urban Resilience. I just received information that uh, Vetseslav Mir is not with us. I'm very sorry for that. I wasn't aware uh, of his absence, but I just received information as well that uh, there is um, the fourth speaker of this very part, uh, Mr. Tobias Strachl uh, from Technische Universität in Dresden. So I would like to invite uh, the, as a third speaker, uh, Mr. Strach, uh, who was supposed to be the fourth one. Anyway, uh, Tobias Strach studied history of art and literature at the Technische Universität in Dresden. During his studies and more than 20 years of uh, repeated commitments with the, general, with the German federal forces, including deployments of, to Kosovo and uh, to Afghanistan in different functions in multinational military headquarters. He specialized uh, in heritage matters during armed conflicts. He is an intercultural advisor of the German Federal Forces. He lives and works currently both in Dresden and Sarajevo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Tobias Strach, uh, great that you are with us. Uh, so, uh, the floor is yours, but I should also say that the uh, the name of your presentation is Threats to Cultural Networks and Communities Resilience. Yeah, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Am I understandable? Hello? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for, the, uh, for this warm introduction. And I'd like to express my thankfulness and gratitude to the European Cultural Center in Krakow, which could even under these difficult circumstances make this conference happen. This is another big achievement of the ICC and I'm part now for the fifth time in this uh, conference and I'm very proud that I can be part of this great endeavor. Yeah, my work as a officer of, uh, as an officer of the German Federal Forces and the art historian, as well as scientifically as practically unseen, is situated at the point of intersection, the frontiers, or if you may wish to express it, the gray area of the academic and the military world. It is where culture turns into conflict and vice versa. These transfer zones, these places of transition are always places of acceleration, of dynamization and of course of huge and bigger problems. So my contribution to this section today will deal most significantly with the problems in the field and not with the solutions we don't have so far. As some of you might know, or perhaps might not know, the majority of military missions today and those of the German Federal Forces especially are so-called stabilization missions. 
The focus of these missions is to stabilize communities involved in or affected by conflict. Culture and cultural heritage are of crucial importance for this aim. Culture and heritage form one of the most significant resources of communities regarding their resilience, understood as the capability to cope with all possible forms of stress. And violent conflicts are by far the most severe forms of stress for communities worldwide. The legal and operational framework for the military as any other international organization or NGO to protect cultural resources for communities' resilience on the strategical and tactical level alike is given and shaped, as you all know, by the Hague Convention and its additional protocols, the Geneva Convention and its additional protocols and the UNESCO World Heritage Convention. And there is where we face the first severe problems. These conventions in some regard are anachronistic. They are drafted in the 1950s and the 1970s and insufficiently supplemented in the 1990s. They do barely include contemporary cultural theory and not at all the transformation of classical conflicts to asymmetric conflicts, asymmetric warfare and migrating conflicts. These conventions are to some regard abstract and exclusive. Cultural objects which are of outstanding universal value for an abstract mankind international community can be utter meaningless for the relevant social group affected by the conflict. On the other hand, most of the objects actually meaningful to that group will never appear in a list of heritage worth protection. These conventions therefore give a very strong filter, allowing us to see only a very small segment or fragment of objects which are meaningful to individuals and groups in conflict zones. If we, on the other hand, integrate the community perspective and additional the contemporary cultural theory, and if we moreover formulate inclusive instead of exclusive criteria for heritage, we see completely different things. These objects we see then are maybe utterly trivial after the Western criteria for cultural heritage. They can be as trivial as an empty snail shell from the conventional point of view, but they are of great importance for the relevant community. The aim, therefore, should not be to play off the contemporary cultural theory against a probably outdated exclusive understanding of culture. It should be, moreover, an equal inclusion of both the conventional and the community-based understanding of cultural objects. And moreover, it should take into account the interdependency of individuals as material and immaterial objects which form a net-like structure. The net of a social community results from manifold acts of mutual signification and identification by, though and with individuals and objects. The most signif significant function of this cultural net is the stabilization of the community. It is fundamental for the community's resilience. The importance of these interdependencies is best illustrated and becomes strikingly evident if single objects are cut out of the cultural net, which is the case in armed conflicts when cultural objects are targeted. 
The loss is not only affecting the object itself, it affects the whole cultural net. If, for instance, the local market of a community in the Middle East is destroyed, it links with family structures and hierarchies, with herding, with farming, with social, social interaction, with communication, as the specific cultural heritage of this community. The whole net is affected then. And if the cultural net of a community is destroyed, the whole community is destroyed, even if most of the individuals will survive. One of the major results of destroyed cultural nets from the, fall, from the fall of the Berlin Wall and the westernization of the former socialist countries up to the war in Syria is migration. But armed conflict is only one threat to cultural nets and communities' resilience. Others are migrating conflicts. The asymmetric conflicts of the 21st century can no longer be contained or limited to the region of their origin. The conflict in Syria, for example, has long entered Europe, as did the conflict in Iraq or the conflict in Afghanistan or the multifold conflicts in Northern Khan. The actual heritage of was either targeted or used stage for in 216 and in three times in Paris in 217 and again in Nice in 220. How do we treat the increasing attacks against Jews, Jews and Jewish cultural heritage in European cities? What do they mean to the resilience of European societies? And what does the presence, the increasing of heavily armed police or even military forces in the European capitals, what does that mean to the cultural heritage of the European constitutions as a major source of societal resilience and uh, old European heritage? Another threat is political change, the change of political systems and its simplification. How devastating were the changes to Eastern, East German communities, for example, in the rural regions after the political changes of the 1990s? What did the closing of schools, pubs, cinemas, agricultural cooperatives, village shops under the idols of efficiency and economy in Eastern Saxony, Brandenburg and Mecklenburg, Vorpommern, what did this do to the resilience of the local communities? About terrorism, I have said something already at the point of migrating conflicts, but another threat to cultural nets and communities' resilience is the radicalization of the political discourse as we witness it all over Europe and overseas at the very moment. If one analyzes the discourse of the far-right AFD in Germany, one will realize that their attacks and attempts to destabilize communities strategically follow and deepen the cultural fault lines resulting from the political change, which I mentioned at the point ago before. And the less resilient communities are, the more receptive they become for perspective and arguments. Another devastating blow to community's resilience was the artificial shutdown of large parts of the cultural net, the COVID lockdown in Germany, for example. There was one example from the first closing shop of an in maker, it was a builder, which had hundreds of clients from kids over schools and to teachers and orchestral musicians. It was one workshop, one craftsman, one element taken to cultural north in effect like a bomb mushroom had a devastating effect for the economy of a net of households, the life plans of hundreds of individuals, the psychological sanity of a good part of the society. There were hundreds of examples and cases from as such only in Berlin.
Another big threat to cultural nets and community liens are destabilization of the as Stumble currently conducted by Russian intelligence. The instrumentalization of parts of the Montenegrin, Bosnian, Serbian, Ukrainian Western society is tailor-made to divide and destabilize communities and therefore analyzes, exploits cultural fault lines, fault lines of culture and between the different ethnicities. And the threat, last but not least, poses the globalization under the auspicious of commission and tation. The city of Sarajevo, where I currently live in, becomes more and more indistinguishable from another cities in Europe. The same Hugo Boss stores, the same drug stores, fast foods as everywhere in the world. Garnished with some folklore elements as cultural heritage made up for tourists. But we all know that the homogeneous systems are far less resilient than the heterogeneous ones. Another severe problem we face with heritage in conflict is that of the so-called vectors and management of information and knowledge. As vectors, we understand all individuals or groups which are able to enter and leave scenarios of conflict in the broadest sense. It can be a conflict in Syria, it can be a, a social war who mediates a conflict in a French Due to their task and profession, these vectors have more or less strong filters when they enter a conflict zone. This is pretty clear. A doctor sees other things than an architect or a soldier. And in addition to these filters, the rules of the institutions these individuals working for have quite is the slide coming? The connection is lost, it says. Yes, no, that was not the slide. Yeah. Another major problem is the availability of text. The links between individuals and objects in the cultural net are all made of text, orally or written text. If you want to trace the making of meaning, it is always text we are tracing. The Facebook post you see at the moment was done six weeks ago by my friend Khalil Minavi. He is the director of the Afghanistan News during three decades of war, Pakistan has lost of its archives and 80% of its population destination for conflicts in the 21st century and a place of horrible destruction as well as of natural as of the cultural heritage. We still don't know too much about the cultural objects vanishing every day like the traditional for example the traditional nomad roads of the two 
Tuareg and the Fulbe in Mali due to a terrible security situation. But we, don't, but we do know that these nomad, nomad routes of the Tuareg and Fulbe are obviously core elements linking economy, tradition, families, communication, reputation, etc. And they vanish before we even had the chance to, to describe them properly. One task... Where is something missing? One task to stabilize communities and to strengthen their resilience, therefore, for us is to define a whole set of criteria for cultural objects worth to be protected in addition to the convention criteria. Replace them, but in addition, objects which are valuable for stabilizing should be individual driven and not conventional driven. It should be in some regard profitable by all parties. One resource, one culture, which does this uh, new criteria in a sense, I again lost the connection with the remote control. One, one, one cultural object which symbolizes this criteria in a real sense is the traditional marketplace. It is the, in, in the traditional trade of goods as one of the oldest forms of cultural heritage and one of the main sources of communities' resilience. But not only marketplaces, there is other cultural objects which apply these new criteria. I give you a short example. When the war in Bosnia was over in 1990, 1996, excuse me, 1996, the international community was keen to figure out objects, material objects, which could be used as symbols for reconciliation. And they choose, of course, the convenient symbol of the bridge in Mostar, the Stare Most. It was meant to reconcile the ethnicities of the Catholic Croats on one hand of the river Neretva and the Bosnian Muslims on the other hand of the river, river Neretva. And the bridge was a symbol convenient symbol for that aim, as well as the side with any religious group. Now, 25 years after their reconstruction and after the war, we see that these monuments have contributed nothing to the reconciliation of the ethnicities. Monster, for example, the, the ethnicities in Monster are more divided than ever before. And the Vietnitsa is a symbol for the international community, not for any ethnicity or the different nationalities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. A completely different approach took Veto Nukulari, Alirisa Arenlia, and Nita Deta from Kosovo. There are three Kosovo Albanians who, right after the war, analyzed what was uniting the Yugoslav nations and ethnicities before the war broke out. And they didn't come to manifestations, churches and mosques and bridges and public buildings because these exactly were the symbols which divided the communities before the war in Yugoslavia. But they found out that the elements, the cultural elements which united the Yugoslav different Yugoslav peoples was rock music on one hand and film feature and documentaries on the other hand. So what they did was, was what these three Albanian at that time kids did, was to find an international documentary film festival, short film festival, which over the years became one of the 25 most important documentary film festivals worldwide. 
and it didn't was stop there. They include Serbs, Croatians, Kosovo Albanians, Bosnian, Macedonian, uh, film workshop. Right? Those on think level to that culture festival could build ink. National films. You're not, if you check the boards of the international film festivals from Leipzig over Berlinale in Berlin to the Los Angeles Film Festival, you will barely find any film festival which has not one of the names Aliresa Arenlio, Veto Nocolari, or Nita Deda in its juries. So they replace the by the war destroyed cultural net, they find a substitute, a very functional and efficient substitute to replace this cultural net. And whereas three small Kosovo Albanians much more effective than the whole international community, including the European Commission and UNESCO. I come to my last slide. Although we speak of cultural goods, culture is not always good. Cultural objects are the projection surface for any kind of meaning and can easily be turned into expression of conflict. Over the years, the Frauenkirche in Dresden, for example, was made the projection surface of a far-right discourse and was instrumentalized to divide the German society far beyond the city of Dresden. The church, therefore, became not only a prominent symbol for the reunification of Germany, but also of its new division. We should be aware that if we are able to stabilize communities by the means of culture, we at the same time possess all the necessary instruments to destabilize communities. We should be aware of the enormous responsibility of with this knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this really uh, intriguing and uh, very special presentation. However, there were some problems, technical problems with the connection and uh, there was the echo uh, from time to time. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, anyway, uh, I was really uh, fascinated with, um, with your presentation. Uh, it's, it's a fact that we are very acquainted with the image of the reconstructed monuments. Uh, we believe that a reconstructed monument can be a symbol of some new uh, beginning, some optimism is uh, so very connected to this image, but in fact uh, it might be a completely different uh, story. So uh, thank you for uh, pushing us to rethink our uh, visual uh, connection to the uh, to the uh, to the past well uh, uh, we don't have any more presentation uh, during this very session so i would like to express my gratitude to all of the three speakers and to invite uh, two more speakers uh, professor krumina konkova and dr edita gavron uh, to us i hope the technical uh, Colleagues, uh, yeah, they just uh, connected us with two more speakers. So uh, it's a time for the questions and uh, answers uh, to all of the uh, participants of this very session. Uh, I would like to say that please use chat to ask questions if there are any questions. Uh, maybe they will come. Uh, at the moment, I don't see uh, any questions. So. I will uh, use this privilege to ask, uh, and uh, at first I would like to ask the question to Professor um, uh, Krumina Konkova. Uh, I was wondering uh, about the social, uh, uh, social echo, social uh, uh, vision of these very places that you mentioned, uh, the places of atrocity. Uh, you presented us the uh, places of, of the history that uh, in some way are being uh, transformed into the places of memory. And uh, uh, we've seen the places that during the Soviet era were somehow manipulated. So there was some kind of a game going on about the memory of the places, uh, some kind of uh, misinterpretation. 
So, um, uh, wh how it is today? What is the answer of the Latvian society to uh, such places and to uh, the image of the uh, past of the World War II? Well, <clears throat> I, I think that the reaction of Latvian society uh, differs from the generation. The oldest generation, seniors, uh, which uh, uh, has experience of uh, war time uh, and uh, know uh, about Holocaust in reality, they uh, don't like to to speak about it. They don't to remember uh, these events and. But uh, the situation with the new generation is uh, opposite. Uh, the youngest generation uh, is very interested to um, to preserve uh, these monuments, to to discuss uh, uh, the Holocaust events, and and to to make some connections with the Jewish uh, community of Latvia. Uh, we, um, uh, I, I would like to mention that we have the um, another community as it was uh, in the pre-war period because uh, almost the most uh, Jewish community of the pre-war um, period uh, was killed. And this community is, which is in Latvia now, it is a different community. They came to Latvia uh, during the Soviet time. And we have o only uh, eight survivors of uh, Holocaust events in Latvia uh, currently. Uh, and uh, so uh, for, for the younger generation, it's uh, also the, uh, one of the tasks is to uh, speak to this new Jewish community about Holocaust events. Because they also don't, don't know anything about it. It's, a, it's, it's another community. And so we, we have uh, very interesting discussions concerning Holocaust, but uh, these discussions mainly uh, is between uh, representatives of, of academics, uh, and uh, of representatives of the youngest generation. Thank you so very much. Uh, the city of Krakow right now is in the process of a big discussion about the former concentration camp in Płaszów. And I would like to ask Dr. Gavron about, uh, maybe not about the Płaszów, but uh, you presented us the city of Krakow and its struggle with its uh, Jewish past, Jewish history, uh, Jewish memory, uh, in many places forgotten, uh, invisible, uh, and still uh, waiting to be uh, somehow regained. But I would like to ask about how it is in the other cities of uh, our region. Krakow, at least in my opinion, uh, is in the process, but a lot was already achieved and uh, how this process can be seen from the perspective of the other uh, cities uh, or, or at least metropolitan areas of central and eastern europe well um i could use uh, many examples but uh, let me focus on the other city which is dear to my heart uh, uh, prague uh, which is in the region and it also embraces ashkenazi community uh, and uh, I see the differences uh, in the uh, approach uh, to the uh, heritage, uh, Jewish heritage in the city. Uh, but uh, uh, this difference is mainly uh, in uh, the uh, players, in the actors uh, who are involved in uh, the process of preservation and promotion of Jewish heritage. Uh, in case of uh, Krakow, we, as you rightly noticed, we are in the process and uh, um, Krakow, uh, um, the city of Krakow has a lot of uh, achievements when it comes to the preservation of Jewish heritage, uh, when it comes to um, acknowledging the Jewish past, uh, and I'm uh, um, not in any uh, way try to, trying to diminish it, uh, I'm just uh, trying to focus on the next steps. Uh, uh, but in uh, in Krakow, uh, 
who are uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 key uh, what are the key institutions that are uh, involved in uh, preserva uh, preservation of the Jewish uh, uh, heritage and uh, um, uh, promoting uh, Jewish heritage. It's uh, mainly the city of Krakow. Uh, it's the city institutions such as uh, uh, the Museum of Krakow. Uh, and uh, uh, there is uh, uh, some significant support from uh, the private institution, from the uh, NGOs, uh, but also from uh, the Jewish uh, community uh, and uh, academic uh, institutions as well. Uh, as I see the situation, for example, in Prague, uh, the uh, uh, Jewish religious congregation, the Jewish community is uh, um, uh, becoming the, the, the key player when it comes to the museums, uh, because uh, the Jewish Museum of Prague uh, is under the uh, um, uh, auspices of, of uh, uh, the community. And uh, it organized uh, the process of uh, um, commemoration and education uh, about, uh, about the past within the uh, infrastructure of the community, mainly the synagogues. Um, so when you compare the two, I think, uh, same size and uh, similar heritage uh, uh, cities, uh, there are some lessons to be learned from the example uh, of Prague. Uh, but also, I think uh, Prague might learn something from uh, from Krakow. Uh, I think what would be um, good for the whole process of talking about Jewish heritage in Krakow is uh, um, the uh, conscious and active, not just passive voice from the community. Uh, and uh, I know that the Jewish religious congregation um, which is in charge of uh, some buildings, uh, particularly synagogue, is uh, uh, involved in the process. But I would like to uh, uh, see also um, uh, Jewish uh, intellectuals and uh, uh, Jewish thinkers to be involved in a decision-making process, in um, thinking and sharing some guidelines, some priorities for uh, preservation of, of, the, uh, of the heritage. Thank you so much. And I would also like to ask the question to Tobias Strachl. Uh, you presented us the bridge of Mostar from a completely different angle and perspective that we usually see this very place. Uh, as you just rightly pointed out, uh, it's a symbol of uh, bridging the uh, problematic past and overgoing a problematic past uh, uh, in the eyes of the international community, but uh, in the local community, it's uh, it's something completely different. So um, I would like to ask about uh, how to deal uh, with the heritage, which is still so very dividing. Uh, if I properly understood your presentation, uh, how to use this heritage to educate and to overgo the everyday problems that are dividing the, the societies. Well, thank you very much for that question. The first thing is a plain and simple thing that when we go, for example, as tourists to some place, then there's possibilities we can do with things we perceive and we see. Either we project ourselves into the things and then we find ourselves in the things or we let the things work and do something in us and when, when we want to instrumentalize the heritage in post or in co post conflict or in conflict zones for reconciliation and peace building there's a completely different thing when we go there and project ourselves, in that case, the international community into the things, which sometimes a pretty romantic view on culture and cultural goods, or if we, before we do that, we do a thorough analysis of that cultural heritage, we can find, and this is not interesting so much what we already know, 
because we know that already. More, much more interesting for that reason are things we don't know, we don't see. I call that the cultural negativity. These things which are pushed aside, which are from the consciousness of the communities, which are, let's say, in the basement of the communities. We have to find these things to understand the cultural heritage of the community. So the reconstructions, when we do that, there's good reasons to do it and there's good reasons for not doing it, should be based on a thorough analysis of the perspective of the respective community. We want to reconstruct the things. And in the case of the study Most and Monster, it's pretty clear what was the model before. It was Ivo Antrich's book, Natrina Chupri, the bridge over the Drina, which gave the romantic imp impression that a bridge, and this is a very old symbol of the of the of the tradition of Western Europe, the bridge could bridge the things which are divided. Totally forgetting that. If you reconstruct the bridge, you have to constitute the abyss before. Well, thank you so very sober image of what actually heritage can be. Uh, I don't see any more questions uh, on our chat. There are no questions. So in this case, I think it's time to uh, end this very part of the uh, resilience session. I would like to express my great gratitude to all of the uh, speakers of this very session. Professor uh, Krumina Konkova, Dr. Gavron, uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, Tobias Strachl. Uh, we are discussing the issues of uh, atrocity, uh, atrocities of the past and atrocity of the uh, re recently, uh, relatively uh, recent uh, past. Uh, so uh, we could see a completely different uh, perspective. Uh, dedicated to uh, similar uh, issues and we were discussing the question of overcoming uh, these problems so thank you so very much and uh, what i want uh, to say is that we will be back uh, this time at uh, 2 30 in one hour time uh, there will be a second part of uh, today's session dedicated to resilience. There are still three uh, presentations uh, in this very session today. So please be with us. We will see in one hour time.